In the previous module, I talked about the spectrum of independent to dependent clauses and how they combine in a sentence. And I said that there's three types of dependent clauses that are actually a little bit more on the independent side of the spectrum. They each have their own tense marking. There's definitely a clear tense inside of them. And they seem to have an overt subject um, in the way that the highly dependent ones tend to have a very covert subject, a subject that you actually never see. And I'm going to talk about those three types of clauses, those three types of mostly independent dependent clauses. And these three types of clauses each act as a modifier to a different element in the syntax tree. So the first is the relative clause, aka an adjective clause. And this is where a whole clause is acting as a sister to an N. It's the modifier of an N, the modifier of a noun. That's why it's kind of kind of adjective-y. So I remember the day that I lost my hat. That I lost my hat is telling me more about the day. It's kind of answering the question, which day? Of all of the possible days um, that exist, which is the one that I'm talking about? So it's actually, you can see, it's kind of determinary too, which is why I don't necessarily love the language of adjective clause for these things. They seem more like a determiner clause. But in most English textbooks or other language textbooks, you'll see these called adjective clauses. Relative clause is also fine, and it's because you're relating some element in the smaller sentence, like I lost my hat then, I lost my hat on that day um, to some element in the larger one. I remember the day. I remember the day that I lost my hat on that day. And so because the day is kind of part of both ideas, it's both the object of the verb remember, and it's also telling me when I lost my hat. Because there's a shared element in the smaller clause and, and in the bigger clause, I can sort of relate these two together. They become, this is a relative clause. That I lost my hat is a relative clause, describing which day, telling me more about the day. A complement clause is when the clause is actually a sister to the verb head. It's the object of a verb. Basically, this is very object-y. Um, these are often called noun clauses because they can act as the object of a verb the way that a noun can. Um, these could also be uh, the subject of a verb as well. But um, I remember that I lost my hat. I remember it. That I lost my hat. It's not saying which day or which kind of day. It's actually telling me what I remember itself. It's not describing the object of the verb remember the way that it does here. It's just it is the object of the verb remember. I could also say that I lost my hat surprised me, or that I lost my hat surprised no one. In which case, that I lost my hat is acting as like the subject of the verb. Um, this is why it's kind of sometimes called a noun clause. Um, subordinate clauses. Um, will be a sister not just to the verb, but to a V bar. It's usually a sister. It's modifying the combination of a verb and its object. It's giving me sort of extra adjunct optional information about how some verb happened, whereas this is usually giving me required information about the object of a transitive verb. So in this way, they're kind of adverby because adverbs provide extra or optional adjunct information about how a verb happened. So like, I remember that day because I lost my hat. I'm using this sentence, I lost my hat, um, not to be the object of the verb remember or not to tell me which day, but it's telling me why I remembered that day. It's giving me more information about the combination of the verb remember and its object. It's why I remembered it. So here, this is giving you more information about just the object. In this one, it is the object. Of, it's, it is what I remember. Here, it's giving me optional or extra information about the verb plus its object. It's telling me more about remembered it, remembered that day. It's telling me why I remember that day. It could be when I remember that day. I remembered that day after I lost my hat. Um, it could be telling me information about how I remembered that day like it was yesterday. Um, so these sorts of clauses are called subordinate clauses. So if we look at these examples, can we figure out which of those three types it is? That the beer went sour surprised me. It surprised me. So that is the complementizer which introduces this um, partly dependent clause, which the beer went sour is its own sentence. I've got this extra word, this glue word, this complementizer here. It surprised me. So this is a complement clause. This is AKA a noun clause. I went to school with a guy. Okay, that's its own sentence. 
he is now CEO of a major corporation. I can relate to those two sentences together because they have some shared information. The guy I went to school with is the same guy who is now the CEO of a major corporation. So I could say, I went to school with the guy who is now CEO of a major corporation. This underlined clause is a relative clause. Who is the complementizer here? And if I were to make a, a mistake that learners often make, I would actually overtly reproduce this pronoun. I went to school with the guy who he is now CEO, but actually you don't need that. You don't need to reduplicate this pronoun inside of relative clause because the person who is the who is the same as the person who is the he. So I can cancel this out. I went to school with a guy who is the CEO. And this whole thing, who is the CEO of a major corporation, is telling me more information about this guy. It's like an adjective. It's a descriptive. It's telling me which of the guys is the one of in every real or imaginary world is the one that I went to school with. Um, unless the stock market gets better, we're going to lose some money. In this case, this is the complementizer here, just the way, who was the complementizer of this relative clause, that was the complementizer of this complement clause, this noun clause, unless is. And unless the stock market gets better is not the object of the verb lose. Um, it's not telling me which of the many monies is the one that I'm talking about. No, it's giving me more information about this whole idea of losing some money. Um, it's going to it's give me information about the conditions under which I would lose some money, when I would lose some money. I would only lose some money um, unless the stock market gets better. Um, so in this case, this is a subordinate clause. Um, see if you can think through these other examples. Maybe pause the screen and see if you can tell what is the complementizer here. Is this complementizer introducing a adjective aka relative clause that it's functioning to describe more information about which of the nouns I'm talking about? Is it a noun clause, aka complement clause, where it's acting as if this whole clause were a noun itself, the object of a verb or the subject of a verb? Or is this a subordinate clause where the combination of the complementizer and then this embedded clause is telling me more information about some verb noun combination, some verb object combination. It's optional information about when, why, how something happened. So these three types of clauses, there actually is sort of a little bit of a range of forms that perform that same function. Whether she sewed that dress, I can't say. I can't say whether she sewed that dress. I can't say that. Um, or I think that it's going to rain tomorrow. I think that it's going to rain tomorrow. I think it. Um, in this case, this is like pretty much a full sentence on its own. We've got a subject, we've got a verb that's got time marking. Um, it's, it's kind of fully finite. There's participial forms which sort of play this rule where I can use a participial clause as if it was a noun. Giving my cat a bath is always a nightmare. It is always a nightmare. This is sometimes called the gerund clause. I enjoy my cat smelling fresh and clean though. Um, I enjoy it. So my cat smelling fresh and clean though is going to be the gerund clause. It's kind of, it's like one of these noun clauses, but it's using this participial form, this verb ing. Or you can have an infinitival form um, with this too. I don't like that. I don't like it. What don't you like? What is that? I don't like people to judge me based on my appearance. So here there's no actual time. It's an infinitive verb here. This is an infinitive clause. People to judge me based on my appearance. Um, to give me all the jewels in the world is what he promised me. Um, in this case, I can say it is what he promised me. I can replace this whole two infinitival phrase with a pronoun it. So in this case, the infinitive clause is sort of acting like one of these complement or noun clause. It's acting like um, the subject of the verb is or the subject of the verb promise kind of in a way. Let's look at this set of sentences which include these sort of complement clauses, these noun clauses. So a regular one to number one, I don't know something. Two, I don't know. Is he coming? So in this case, I've got two sentences, and here I have that yes or no movement. The is moved up to this first spot here. Is he coming? What's confusing for learners is that you can't do this. I don't know if is he coming, and the problem here is that if and is would be trying to occupy the same spot in the syntax tree. They're both trying to occupy that complementizer spot, that C spot. So if I'm going to have a yes or no movement, 
this auxiliary is is going to move to the same spot that that complementizer would occupy. So I can't say this. I don't know if is he coming. Because if blocks that complementizer spot, is cannot move up ahead. So now I have to say, I don't know if he is coming. I don't know. When are we going? In this case, I've got these two sentences here. Um, but I can't use this order. I don't know. When are we going? <laughs> um, again, the when and the are are going to be trying to occupy that sort of same spot here. I don't know when are we going. The are can't move to that complementizer spot because the when is already going to be there. So since when is occupying that complementizer spot, it blocks the R from moving up there. So we have to say, I don't know when we are going. I can't say, I don't know when are we going. Um, but these are mistakes that learners would often make if they don't really interpret in their mental model that if and when are complementizers and is and R are complementizers. So they would be vying for the same spot. They can't both be there. Um, he said something. He said, is he coming? He said that he is coming. Well, we saw why number 10 would be right. Right, that is sort of occupying the complementizer spot. So is can't move up there. Is has to stay below the he and be. I, he said that he is coming. So why is number nine grammatical? Well, I have to indicate with a pause that I'm actually using quotation, quotation marks. And Korean has a nice way around this. They use urago or dago to indicate the quotation marks actually in pronunciation. We don't pronounce the quotation marks in English or in most other European languages, we just say, he said, is he coming? And my pause there indicates that this is actually a direct quote. So I'm not held accountable for whatever syntax. I'm not trying to embed this syntax inside the larger one, because as soon as I'm using a direct quote, it can have its own syntax and follow its own rules. So I can't, but if I tried to put that in there, this wouldn't work again. He said that, is he coming? That would not work. The subordinate clauses, just as complement clauses I said had a fully finite, a participial, and an infinitival form, um, this is a clause that's acting like an adverb. It's a clause that's giving me optional information about the combination of a verb and its object. So like, I'll give you a second chance. Give is the verb, you is the indirect object, a second chance is the direct object, giving you a second chance. Because I like you is optional information talking about why I give you a second chance. It's describing the whole combination of that thing. It's describing a whole V bar. Because I like you, I'll give you a second chance. But it's got, this is like fully finite. We've got a tensed verb here. We've got a subject. Everything is there. I've been coming to this bar since I moved here. Since I moved here is optional information describing the combination of coming to this bar. When is this coming to this bar happening? Um, so this is a clause being used to give optional information. It's a sister to some verb plus another element. Um, here it's a, a sister to the combination of the verb and this prepositional phrase to this bar. Um, there can be participial forms, sort of these uh, participial verb clauses, which are used in this way after giving me a good talking to. So giving me a good talking to seems like a gerund clause itself, and then I can put an after in front of it. After giving me a good talking to, he let me go. And I can actually have some non-finite, some infinitive things here. I came here to get an answer. Like I came here in order to get an answer. Here to get an answer is describing not just the verb came, but it's describing why I came here. So I'm using an infinitive clause in this sort of subordinate or adverb clause type way. Rather than me do it, why don't you give it a try? So this is sort of a much rarer construction, but we can even use a bare infinitive, like do it, me do it. Um, and rather than me do it, is telling me about like the conditions under which you give it a try. It's describing give it a try. Give being the verb, it being the indirect object, and a try being the direct object. Relative or adjective clauses also can have this, the fully finite form, the products which IBM built its reputation on, lost their allure, the reason why the group was set up seemed forgotten, IBM built its reputation on them, or IBM built its reputation on the products, the products lost their allure, I can smush those two sentences together, the products which IBM built its reputation on them, lost their allure. The reason why the group was set up for that reason 
seemed forgotten. So the group was set up for that reason. The reason seemed forgotten. Because the reason is shared in both of them, I can say the reason why the group was set up seemed forgotten. So these are fully finite. Um, we've got a tense verb here. Everything is fine. There's some participial forms. Seeing the woman sleeping under the tree reminded me of Eve in the garden. So sleeping under the tree is kind of describing which of the women I'm talking about, the same way that IBM built its reputation is telling me which of the products I'm talking about, or the group was set up is telling me which of the reasons I am talking about. The forest burned after weeks of fire would take decades to recover. Here, this passive participial clause is sort of telling me more information about the noun forest here. So these are sort of adjective -y. This is telling me more information about the women. This is telling me more information about the forest. So it kind of functions like a relative clause, even though it doesn't have a relative pronoun or it doesn't really look like that. Then we can even have infinitive uh, forms, infinitive clauses, which kind of act like these relative clauses. The man to blame for all this trouble is the president, blaming him for all this trouble. So to blame for all this trouble, in this case, is telling me more information about the man. So it's kind of behaving the way a relative clause would, but it's not fully finite. It doesn't have a subject and a tensed verb. It just has an infinitive form with a covert subject. One little funny fact about these sort of relative clauses is there's something called pied piping which is where the relative pronoun actually grabs another element from the sentence and pulls it up to its complementizer position along with it. So that's the guy who I can never remember his name. So a lot of times you'll hear this in speaking, that's the guy who I can never remember his name. But in writing, we tend to reflect a, an older form of the English language where we would say, that's the guy whose name I can never remember. And so as who comes to be a relative pronoun, it kind of comes up here and it pulls the name along with it. It pied pipes those things. It takes them to the front the way that the Pied Piper of Hamelin lured all of the children of Hamelin out of the city with his music. Um, that's the box which I keep all my baseball cards in. This is most common in speaking, but people will say in writing, that's the box in which I keep all my baseball cards. In this case, the relative pronoun which grabs its preposition that it came from. That's the box I keep all my baseball cards in it. So it gets replaced by the relative pronoun which, and it grabs the in, in which, and takes the in all the way up to the spot with it. That's the box in which I keep all my baseball cards. So this happens with prepositions and then with this um, possessive marker with like who, whose, he, his, um, the guy, the guys. Um, those are the elements which can pipe.